everybody, welcome back to Exmo Lex. I have a lot that I want to talk about today, but before we get started, I really quickly want to remind everybody to please subscribe to this channel if you're not already. I'm getting pretty close to a thousand subscribers, and when I get there, I'm planning on going back to church. Not permanently. I'm planning on attending church for the first time in almost a year to just listen, observe, go to the sacrament meeting, listen to a lesson, and interact with some members and see what they think of ex-Mormons. You're not going to want to miss that, so please hit the subscribe button. Today we are going to talk about something I find both fascinating and terrifying, and that is the role that LDS prophets play in the lives of the members of their church. Do you think that Mormons trust the prophet too much? I am in a Mormon group on Facebook, and there I made a poll about what the members think about the prophet. And before you ask, I I checked the rules. It's not against the rules of the group for me to be there. It's not against the rules for me to make the poll, and it's not against the rules for me to share the results. I checked the rules because I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to upset anybody. And by the way, when I read the rules, one of them is literally that as an as a person going into the group that is maybe a questioning Mormon, an ex-Mormon, a non-Mormon, whatever. You're not allowed to enter the group and tell the Mormons that they're wrong, which I found kind of hilarious. I actually made this poll and um, it was up for not even 24 hours. A lot of people had commented and a lot of people had voted on it. And I get an admin comment that says this poll isn't very good content because it's making people question the prophet in a hypothetical situation please try to post more uplifting content next time. And then he blocked comments on my post. And I was surprised because uh, my poll, it wasn't, I didn't feel like it was worded in a way that was harmful, um, but it did make people think. And I guess that that's not uplifting <laughs> to make people think. So anyways, so although he did block comments on my poll after maybe 15 hours, uh, it didn't stop people from being able to vote in the poll. My poll was this. Would you do what the prophet says, no matter what it was, even if it was the craziest thing imaginable? And their options were yes, no, and not sure. I wanted to keep it simple. The vast majority of Mormons in this group answered that yes, they would follow the prophet and do what he said no matter what. The final count uh, on the poll before I finish writing the outline for this video was about 78% yes, 10% no, and 12% unsure. At least 78% of those Mormons would do anything the prophet told them to do, no matter how crazy it sounds. It's kind of scary when you think about it. As a Mormon, I think I can honestly say that I probably also would have answered yes to this poll, but when it came down to it, I would not have done anything. But I would have tried to be as loyal as I could because I believed that the prophet would never lead me astray and that he was speaking for God. So let's learn a little bit more about what Mormons think of their prophet. We obviously know they revere him. When I was still a member, I read this lovely little gem of an address given by Ezra Taft Benson at BYU in 1980. This was before Benson was made a prophet. It was when he was just in the Quorum of the Twelve. And once upon a time, this was actually one of my favorite talks. I'm going to link everything I talk about in the description, and I highly recommend that you go check it out when you get time because it is very interesting. And especially if you're a Mormon watching this video, I, I know you guys watch, I see your comments, go check out the links and read all of this for yourself because it is extremely interesting no matter what side of the fence you're on. So basically, this talk is meant to address all the ways in which the prophet is the best, everything he says is true, and how important it is to follow him. It's called 14 Fundamentals in Following the Prophet. Lots of alliteration here. First, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. So basically, it doesn't matter what anyone else says, what the prophet says goes, because he's the only one who is speaking for God in everything. Second, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. I'd like to share an account recited by Ezra Taft Benson in this portion of his talk, and when you have time, I strongly recommend you go read the whole thing in its entirety because it is fascinating. Brother Joseph turned to Brother Brigham and said, Brother Brigham, I want you to go to the podium and tell us your views with regard to the living oracles and the written word of God. Brother Brigham took the stand, and he took the Bible and laid it down. He took the Book of Mormon and laid it down. And he took the Book of Doctrine and Covenants and laid it down before him. And he said, There is the written word of God to us concerning the work of God from the beginning of the world almost to our day. And now, said he, when compared to the living oracles, those books are nothing to me. Those books do not convey the word of God direct to us now, as do the words of a prophet or a man bearing the holy priesthood in our, in our day and generation. I would rather have the living oracles than all the writing in the books. That was the counsel he pursued. When he was through, Brother Joseph said to the congregation, 
Brother Brigham has told you the word of the Lord, and he has told you the truth. So for Mormons, when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter if Jesus Christ himself said it in the scriptures, because the living prophet is more important to them. They believe that the prophet literally speaks for God in everything, so it doesn't matter if it contradicts the Bible, the Book of Mormon, or the Doctrine and Covenants. It's all good, because the prophet is number one now. Third, the living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. Benson says in his talk, Beware of those who would set up dead prophets against the living prophets, for the living prophets always take precedence. This one is really great if you're the current prophet, because now you can excuse whatever was said in the past and replace it. Very convenient. Fourth, the prophet will never lead the church astray. This is a fun one, because we've seen several prophets make false predictions and false prophecies over the years. In the description of this video, I have included a link to a list of prophecies made by Joseph Smith, and it also includes what the church is now saying about those prophecies. Again, after you finish watching this video, I encourage you to go check them out because it's fascinating and it might make you roll your eyes and shake your head because it also is a bit absurd. But one of Joseph's prophecies that stands out the most is his failed second coming prediction, which again, I have left a link to in the description of this video. Go check out the full thing when you have time, but here's the basics of it. President Smith then stated that the meeting had been called because God had commanded it, and it was made known to him by vision and by the Holy Spirit. He then gave a relation of some of the circumstances attending while journeying to Zion, our trials, sufferings, and said God had not designed us all for nothing, but he had it in remembrance yet, and it was the will of God that those who went Zion with a determination to lay down their lives, if necessary, should be ordained to the ministry, and go forth to prune the vineyard for the last time, or the coming of the Lord, which was nigh, even fifty-six years should wind up the scene. If this prophecy was correct, Jesus would have returned in 1891. Fifth, the prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or diplomas to speak on any subject or act on any matter at any time. Here's another convenient one, because it basically allows the prophet to talk about whatever he wants to, no matter what, with no consequences, because he doesn't need any training whatsoever to be an expert on anything. Sixth, the prophet does not have to say, thus saith the Lord, to give a scripture. I'm going to quote Benson directly here. Sometimes there are those who argue about words. They might say the prophet gave us counsel, but we are not obliged to follow it unless he says it is a commandment. But the Lord says of the prophet, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you. Said Brigham Young, I have never yet preached a sermon and sent it out to the children of men that they may not call scripture. I'm not making this up. I pulled this directly from the church website under the heading first presidency message. It's just baffling to me because every single time a prophet messes up or does something controversial or odd, the first thing out of a member's mouth is to say he was just acting as a man. Well, guess what? The prophet of the Lord would beg to disagree with you. His word is scripture. Seventh, the prophet tells us what we need to know, not always what we want to know. Quoting, said President Harold B. Lee, you may not like what comes for the authority of the church. It may conflict with your political views. It may contradict your social views. It may interfere with some of your social life. Your safety and ours depends on whether or not we follow. Let's keep our eye on the president of the church. Why? Because the living prophet gets at what we need to know now, and the world prefers that prophets either be dead or worry about their own affairs. Some so-called experts of political science want the prophet to keep still on politics. Some would-be authorities on evolution want the prophet to keep still on evolution. And so the list goes on. I'm jumping around here, but seriously, when you get time, go read the whole thing. And I know there's a lot, but this is just so juicy, so we're going to keep on going. Said President Marion G. Romney, It is an easy thing to believe in dead prophets, but it is a greater thing to believe in the living prophets. And then he gives this illustration. One day, when President Grant was living, I sat in my office across the street following a general conference. A man came over to me, an elderly man. He was very upset about what had been said in this conference by some of the brethren, including myself. I could tell from his speech that he was from a foreign land. After I had quieted him enough so he would listen, I said, Why did you come to America? I am here because a prophet of God told me to come. Who was the prophet? I continued. Wilford Woodruff. Do you believe Wilford Woodruff was a prophet of God? Yes, sir. Then came the $64 question. Do you believe that Heber J. Grant is a prophet of God? His answer? I think he ought to keep his mouth shut about old age assistance. Now I tell you that a man in his position is on the way to apostasy. He is forfeiting his chances for eternal life. So is everyone who cannot follow the living prophet of God. You guys, I cannot overemphasize enough the seriousness of what is being said here, and I don't think I need to. <laughs> 
Read it and weep. It does not matter what the prophet says. It is always correct, and it is more important than scripture. Eighth, the prophet is not limited by men's reasoning. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is, although we may not see the reason thereof until long after the events transpired. Would it seem reasonable to an eye doctor to be told to heal a blind man by spitting in the dirt, making clay, and applying it to the man's eyes, and then telling him to wash it in a contaminated pool? Yet this is precisely the course that Jesus took with one man, and he was healed. Yikes. Yeah, I, I get that green tea is beneficial for your health, but that's men's reasoning, and I don't care, so don't drink it. Ninth, the prophet can receive revelation on any matter, temporal or spiritual. It seems like we're going over extremely similar points sometimes here, and I honestly think that maybe he just wanted to get to 14 fundamentals to have that alliteration in the title of his talk, but oh well. Basically, what we see here is that it doesn't matter if it's spiritual or secular, the prophet is down to talk about it, and he's always right. Tenth, the prophet may well advise on civic matters. Again, I'm going to quote what Benson said here, and this time I'm going to do it in its entirety because it's pretty short and to the point. When a people are righteous, they want the best to lead them in government. Alma was the head of the church and of the government in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith was the mayor of Nauvoo, and Brigham Young was governor of Utah. Isaiah was deeply involved in giving counsel on political matters, and of his words, the Lord himself said, Great are the words of Isaiah. The prophet believes that he has the right to tell people how to vote. Eleventh, the two groups who have the greatest difficulty in following the prophet are the proud who are learned and the proud who are rich. The learned may feel the prophet is only inspired when he agrees with them. Otherwise, the prophet is just giving his opinion, speaking as a man. The rich may feel they have no need to take counsel of a lowly prophet. Interesting, because modern prophets are historically both rich and well-educated. But this is excellent ammunition to use against people who have studied and who have earned degrees in various fields. These people who are able to advise in scientific, political, and societal matters but if what they've learned contradicts what the prophet says about it, then we can just cite this point and move on. Twelfth, the prophet will not necessarily be popular with the world or the worldly. Ain't that the truth? He says in part, As we come closer to the Lord's second coming, you can expect that the people of the world will become more wicked, and the prophet will be less popular with them. There you have it, guys. It's because of our wickedness, not because of the prophet. Thirteenth, the prophet and his counselors make up the first presidency, the highest quorum in the church. This one seems like super self-explanatory, but again, I guess we're just trying to get to fourteen. Fourteenth, the prophet and the presidency, the living prophet and the first presidency. Follow them and be blessed, reject them and suffer. That almost sounds like a direct threat. Personal anecdote coming. For the past year... I have rejected the prophet and the first presidency, and yet I'm not suffering. I actually plan to do a full video on this soon when I actually reach one year of being out of the church, just to reflect on the past year and how it's been for me and what has changed. But to be honest, this has been one of the best years of my life. I can already hear the Mormons like, but it's just temporary. It's not true joy. You're going to suffer in the afterlife. Okay. So yes, according to this, Mormons should be absolutely 100% loyal to what the prophet tells them to do. He will never lead them astray. His words are scripture, more important than actual scriptures, and he can advise them on any matter, including on how to vote. The most ironic thing about this whole talk is that a Mormon could read it and then note that it was written in 1980 and... Then they could cite point number three and say, well, um, according to point number three, a living prophet's word is more important than a dead prophet's word. So we don't necessarily believe everything that President Benson said in that talk anymore. And just like that, it, it wouldn't matter. None of this would matter to them. It is dangerous for people to follow anyone that blindly. And again, in, a, in this poll of a Mormon group, 78% said that they would do anything the prophet asked, no matter how crazy it sounded. Now, some of the comments on that poll sounded hopeful, like my favorite one uh, that said, no, I would use my brain. Good on you. Then there were more, um, many comments that said something along the lines of, oh, I would pray about it for my own revelation first, but then yes, I would do what he said. That is still dangerous. Um, then there were many, many comments like this one. Yes, unquestionably. I would do what the prophet said, no matter what, unquestionably. I'm reminded of Heaven's Gate cult who followed their leader to a mass suicide. 
They believed he was a prophet, and they followed him unquestionably, too. That'll be it for today, you guys. I'm sorry if I was a little bit snarkier than I normally am in this video. I just find this whole thing kind of shocking, and I've been dealing with it with a bit of sarcasm. I want to emphasize again to check out the links in the description. I've got links to the address given by Ezra Taft Benson. I've got the list of prophecies given by Joseph Smith, and I've got that specific prophecy of the second coming that did not happen. And I've also got a short but very poignant clip about the Heaven's Gate cult that you should really check out. And again, please remember to subscribe. If you thought that this was interesting, please like, comment, and share it. And if you hated it, slam that dislike button. If you guys want to see more of my content and have the opportunity to contribute to one of my future videos, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at xmo underscore lex. Think for yourself, be skeptical, do your research, and whatever you do, don't drink the Kool-Aid. I'll see you guys next time.